Okay, let's talk about this cool case of vertebral osteomyelitis. It was a 23-year-old male presenting with severe mid and lower back pain that got worse over several days to the point where he can barely walk when he comes into the emergency department. He denies any weakness, numbness, or tingling. He denies any bowel or bladder dysfunction. He has no abdominal pain and he is urinating normally. He does have fever and chills, which is interesting. He has no recent trauma, heavy lifting, or history of any back problems that could be explaining his presentation. He has no chronic or past medical history, and he has no history of IV drug use, alcohol use, known, known HIV. On physical exam, he's febrile at 101.6 Fahrenheit. His pulse is 100, blood pressure 134 over 84, respiratory rate 19, and O2 set 99%. He's obese and he appears quite uncomfortable in the stretcher. H, E, and T is normal, neck normal, cardiovascular, he's tachycardic, otherwise normal, palm and abdominal normal. On back exam, he has some left paraspinal and midline lumbar tenderness, worse with movement. And his neurological exam is essentially normal. He's ANO times three, his cranial nerves are okay. His lower extremity strength is normal, sensation normal, patella reflexes are two plus. Uh, we did not perform a gait exam because he was so uncomfortable. In the ED, he's given IV morphine for pain and acetaminophen for his fever. His white blood cell count is 12.5, but it does have a left shift with neutrophil predominance. CRP is slightly elevated. ESR, CMP, and urinalysis are all normal. Pain continued to worsen despite multiple doses of IV morphine. He was still febrile despite acetaminophen. The CT of the abdomen and pelvis did not identify any explanation, especially any GU or GI abnormalities. He was given IV vancomycin and piperacil and tazobactam and admitted to the hospital. So let's talk about vertebral osteomyelitis, which was ultimately this patient's diagnosis, it is characterized by inflammation of the vertebral body due to a bacterial organism. It is the most common spinal infection and diagnosis is often delayed due to nonspecific symptoms. It frequently extends to adjacent vertebral discs and the lumbar spine is most commonly affected, followed by the thoracic and cervical. On the right here, we see some illustrations of what the different spinal infections can look like. So starting with vertebral osteomyelitis here, you can see this in the uh, vertical plane and then in short axis. Uh, and then it can extend down to the disc, and that's when we call it discitis. And if it includes both, we call it spondylodiscitis. Much more rarely is facet joint arthritis. I've never seen that. That's very uncommon. And then you can also have epidural abscess extending back into the dura and towards the spinal cord. And you can have paravertebral abscess as well. So you can have some virulent collections as well. It is typically spread hematogenously. Uh, the number one is staph, uh, staph species, not necessarily staph aureus. In some populations where tuberculosis is endemic, mycobacterium is actually more common. And in elderly patients who tend to get gram-negative infections like UTI, uh, that might be more common. Risk factors include male sex, diabetes, immune suppression, sickle cell disease, hemodialysis, spinal instrumentation, and IV drug use. The clinical presentation includes insidious back pain over weeks or months, associated with night pain, malaise, fatigue, decreased appetite, and fever, which is only seen in half of patients. Physical exam tends to demonstrate tenderness over the affected spinous process or vertebral body, and nearly all patients report localized pain and tenderness. On this lateral view of this x-ray, uh, T10 is marked, so you see T11 and T12 are the arrows. You see involvement of the vertebral bodies here with collapse of T11 and uh, end plate changes at both T11 and T12. This could be seen in an x-ray of a patient with vertebral osteomyelitis. Of course, it is not diagnostic. It just suggests there's something wrong with the spine at this level. Evaluation, so x-rays again are a screening tool. They show bony destruction, sometimes deformities. CT scan better details of the bone and can sometimes detect adjacent masses and abscesses. MRI is of course the gold standard, especially early when the bony changes haven't occurred yet. Very sensitive for edema and inflammation, can characterize the extent of infection, potential for spinal cord involvement if there's any abscess anywhere. And of course, it excludes other pathology that you would consider like um, infection, not just infection, but 
malignancy, foreign body, et cetera. Okay, so this MRI is the initial one here in A, which shows inflammatory signal changes of the vertebral body, this is L4, and then involvement of the end plate here with destruction of some of the posterior aspect of the end plate. And then in follow-up imaging, this is a different sequence, but you still see that collapse of L4 and involvement of the disc of L3 and L4 with collapse of the disc, and then involvement of the inferior anterior end plate of L3 as well. So this is a typical MRI of vertebral uh, osteomyelitis discitis, sometimes called spondylodiscitis. Management includes broad spectrum antibiotics. You wanna, of course, consult, consult infectious disease and neurosurgery. These patients are typically on antibiotics for about six to 12 weeks, which you will adjust based on the microbiology. Indications for surgery include any form of fluid collection, pending cord compression, lack of response to antibiotics, and of course, if there's a spinal epidural abscess, that has to be drained and, and washed out. In the case of our patient, he was ultimately diagnosed with vertebral osteomyelitis, which is what we're talking about. It was in the L4, L5 with increased signal and enhancement, but sparing the discs. He grew out Serratia marseillaisans, which was uh, sensitive to ciprofloxacin and meropenem. Those are the drugs that the infectious disease doctor recommended. The patient did well during his hospitalization and went home on day nine after he was essentially able to walk with minimal pain. He, he drew, improved dramatically. A peripheral uh, line was placed, a PIC line, and he was on three weeks of IV erdapenem and PO ciprofloxacin. So three key points for vertebral osteomyelitis. The first is that is uncommon infection of the spine associated with male gender, diabetes, immunocompromised state, sickle cell disease, hemodialysis, spinal instrumentation, and IV drug use. Signs and symptoms are nonspecific and include indolent back pain, nocturnal back pain, malaise, generalized fatigue, depressed appetite, and fever. MRI is the diagnostic gold standard for both spinal epidural abscess and some of the other infections of the spine. And the treatment requires a prolonged course of antibiotics tailored to the microbiology.